later that day. The hours whittle away slowly. The sun casts its final rays over the rooftops before sinking down over the horizon to be replaced with cold darkness. When my phone's alarm buzzes at 8, I jolt myself awake from dozing. Not a great start for the evening ahead. I let out a breath of relief. At least I don't have to wait any longer. I'd spent most of the afternoon reading over things I already knew and writing down clues I've written a hundred times already, just waiting for the evening to arrive. Standing, I glance about my office, heavily shadowed by the evening's gloom. It's strange for it to be so empty, so quiet. Guess I've kind of gotten used to having Unit Bravo around. Shaking the thought away, I gather up my keys, gun, and badge, then head out of the office. The shrill ring of my cell phone against the quiet makes me jump. I lift the phone from my pocket, Bobby's name emblazoned on the screen. Slipping the phone back into my pocket, I ignore it as it buzzes against my leg. Not only do I not actually want to speak to Bobby, I can just imagine the mayor's reaction if he found out I'd talked to him, and it certainly wouldn't be pleasant. It stops ringing as I reach the front desk. I wave a goodbye to Tina, shiver as I press my hand to the chill glass of the front doors, then feel my phone vibrate again. The screen flashes with a new voice message. No guesses as to who that's from. I don't have time for this. I slip my phone back into my pocket, the screen blinking in annoyance at being ignored. Then, with a satisfied nod, I shove open the front doors and head into the dark of the town. In the center of town. The journey to the square is never a long one, but tonight it's exceptionally quick, probably because this time there's no other traffic, or even people. I park outside Haley's Bakery and rattle the door handle of my car a little until it finally gives. Then I step out into the relatively well-lit, pretty street. It smells cold, the chill hitting my nose and coating my throat. I cough as the cold reaches my chest, bundling my coat up a little tighter. I really hope spring arrives soon. Footsteps make me spin around, and I let out a small sigh to see Unit Bravo emerge from a dark side street. They approach me. Is it always this quiet? Farrah asks, glancing about the square with an almost bored expression. Classy shop fronts lie dark and dormant. No sign of life, not even from the apartments above. It's a quiet town, I reply, stepping towards them. Though it being this quiet is pretty unusual. The murders probably frightened them enough to keep them indoors, Nate says. Not exactly a confidence-boosting statement, seeing as we're the only ones out here. The antique clock above the town hall clicks 8.30. Look, I doubt anything will happen tonight. I pause, glancing over them all. But be careful anyway. Your concern is touching, Morgan states. The words, meant to be biting, lose their effect when spoken through chattering teeth. Here, Adam says, stepping closer, holding out a hand. A tiny black box sits on the top of his palm, no bigger than the top of my thumb. It's an agency radio. My brows quirk up as I look at the size of the thing. We'll stick together as much as possible, but just in case. I shrug, figuring it's a sensible plan. Taking the radio, I clip it to the collar of my jacket. How does it work? Just press it with your finger, Nate explains. After giving it a test and finding just how sensitive a piece of equipment it is, there's no more procrastinating. We head out. I can't help but feel a boost in confidence, with the four agents flanking me as we walk. Two hours into the patrol. I can't remember the last time I just enjoyed a walk, Nate says suddenly, drawing in a deep breath and interrupting the tense silence that had hung around us all for the past couple of hours. Nerves are on edge every shadow catching our attention and every movement making us pause. This isn't supposed to be a stroll, Nate, Adam counters, though I notice a flicker of a smile on the team leader's face as he looks at his companion. Nate shrugs. You have to take the small opportunities when you can. Ugh, Morgan groans, rolling her eyes. Your positivity is making Morgan nauseous again, Nady, Farah adds her chuckle reverberating off the shops lining one side of the street. "'What about you, detective?' Nate asks, ignoring Farrah's teasing. His question makes me flick my head to him, finding the group suddenly studying me. "'What about me?' "'Do you miss patrolling?' 
he clarifies. Or were you glad to give up these duties when you became detective? Glancing down at the street, I give a shrug. It gives me more time in the lab, working on what I enjoy. At least you know what suits you best. Few people care to admit where the strengths really are, Adam says suddenly, catching my attention. There's no sarcasm to his voice. In fact, I'm surprised by the small amount of respect that seems to hold on the words. We continue on down the street, conversation coming easier than it had when we first started out. Even later. Eleven o'clock brings with it a deeper darkness and a still deeper chill. The cold seeps through the pockets of my coat, biting at my fingers and settling with an ache on my shoulders. My walk has turned into a stomp just to try to keep the feeling in my toes. Midnight is our agreed stopping point. I glance up at the large clock tower, protruding into the night sky so high it can be seen from anywhere in the center of town. <sighs> Only 57 minutes to go. The agents had split off a few minutes before, checking out a couple of longer side streets before we have to meet up again. They'd made sure I'd checked my radio was still working at least 10 times before going, but I doubt I'll need it. I'm beginning to half hope something will jump out of the shadows, just to relieve my boredom. Even I could have told the mayor the killer was unlikely to return to the same place where he had already killed. Meanwhile, at the edge of the center of town. Murphy hates cold nights, though at least the cold keeps the clouds away. The moon shines down on the streets, unobstructed. He doesn't know why he's walking out. He'd had his fill of blood from the boy the other night. It will be enough for a while. Walking about is pointless anyway with the humans huddled up in their houses. He can smell their fear, even through the layers of brick and mortar. A thrill crackles through him, knowing he is the cause of such terror. A couple of deaths and a whole town have been brought to its knees. With a low chuckle, he turns to head back, hoping to work on his project for a few more hours. Finding the right human in this small backwater town is a much harder task than it should be. Then a smell hits his nose, wafting through the streets with the faintest of scents. But it is enough to catch his refined senses. It makes his nostrils flare wide, his eyelids flicker shut as he inhales deeply. Blood pulses through veins. The right blood, pulsing through the right veins. He grins. He's found them. Back at the square. Forty-one minutes left. Counting down isn't really helping, but at least it's something to do. Silence stretches as long as the night's shadow, and I let out a breath just to break the quiet monotony. Turning the corner of the block, my heart leaps into my throat as a figure emerges from the dark alleyway beside me. It settles again when I recognize the shape of Adam. Adam! I blurt, trying to relax the adrenaline that had been injected into my system from the fright. He glances over me for a moment before looking away. I apologize. I didn't mean to startle you. Have you found anything? I ask. Seen anyone? He shakes his head. The others will be reporting in with us soon. We can wait until then. Normally it would be such a simple thing to do, wait, except for the heavy, awkward silence which immediately settles over us. Adam keeps his cautiously stoic expression turned away from me. After a while, I find there's an odd sense of calm that comes from standing beside him. It makes my tension ease and sends a flutter through my stomach. Maybe it's his towering, solid build, or possibly the tight-lipped frown I doubt anyone would bother trying to mess with, or the security that radiates off him that wants to cover me like a velvet blanket. The moonlight from above strikes against his features, highlighting every handsome line of his face and outlining the broad shoulders beneath his thick coat. I bite my lip and stare at the man. Pig-headed he may be, but he's certainly difficult to look away from. I quickly shake my head to clear my thoughts, my eyes widening in surprise at my own reaction to him. I shuffle a small step away. Are you all right? He asks, noticing the movement. I nod, turning away slightly to hide the heat radiating on my cheeks. Silence holds us again until he suddenly breaks it with an unexpected question. Tell me, detective, how did someone so young become a detective so quickly? When he says young, I can tell he actually means inexperienced, something which makes me thin my lips. <sighs> detective Real was retiring, I explain. The 
police captain and the mayor decided I was the best to replace her. I leave out the part where the promotion was rushed through. I received no extra training or testing except shadowing Real for a few days before she left, which mostly involved fetching her coffee. Adam stopped staring down the street, instead turning to look at me. I'm surprised. You are far more competent than most detectives I've met. My eyes widened at the compliment, unsure for a moment if I actually heard him correctly. Even he seemed surprised at his own words, as though the statement was a stray thought not to be said aloud. I'd blink out of my stunned silence, then clear my throat. Well, uh, I let out a breath to help with the heat building on my cheeks. Uh, thanks. He stares at me for a moment before glancing away with an uncertain frown. Let's find the others. They're taking too long. Sounds good, I reply, both of us moving to march down the street. Adam suddenly jerks backward a step, twisting around to stare into the darkness beyond. Though I can barely see through the shadow, I snap my focus around to stare too. What is it? I don't know, he says, his words trailing off. I swallow hard. Nearby, Murphy dashes through the streets like a hound after a fox. He sprints through the alleyways with ease, following the scent. It intensifies as he draws closer to the very center of town. There are other scents, supernaturals like him, but they aren't his focus. He cares little except for the vessel. And it's close. So close. His eyes flutter shut as he lets his senses lead him onwards, deftly avoiding the trash cans, parked cars, and other obstacles which block his path. Close. Closer. At the square. There's no movement or sound, yet Adam still glares into the night. It's unnerving, to say the least, watching his body tense and his brow furrow deeply. I flinch as he suddenly whips around, staring at me with the same narrow glare he'd been using with the darkness. His gaze flashes over me in quick inspection, and I open my mouth to speak when he suddenly gets there first. You must be cold, he snaps, and without waiting for a response, he shrugs off his thick coat, swinging it out and then wrapping it around me. He doesn't let go, instead grasping the lapels of the dark gray woolen coat, my body embraced inside of it. The action is so sudden and strange that it takes a few moments to process. Very near. Murphy grinds to a sudden halt, his nose wrinkling. The scent, the sweet scent, is gone. He sniffs at the air, the nectar of the blood smothered by that of a more potent one, another vampire. Ugh, Murphy groans, rolling his lips together. He'll never find the human with that odor masking them. His limbs tense, his eyes wide in worried thought. Has another vampire already found his prey? No. He shakes his head at the thought. Whatever vampire it is won't be able to use their pheromones to get even a bite. Murphy could deal with another vampire if he were more prepared, but not now. The most important thing is that he's confirmed there is another vessel in this hole of a town. He grins into the dark, twisting on his heel and heading back towards the thick of the forest at the town's border. He is content to wait for another night. The other vampire's scent drifts away steadily and Adam lets out a small sigh of relief. Using his coat to mask the detective's scent had been a rash move, but, thankfully, one that had paid off. With the threat gone, Adam turns his focus back to Celeste, surprised to find the detective's cheeks flushed pink, her lower lip caught between her teeth. What Adam hadn't realized when he put the coat around Celeste is that he'd yanked her forwards. The gap between them is now barely a couple of inches. He could feel the detective's pulse fluttering, the vibrations landing against Adam's overly sensitive skin. Coupled with the heat crackling in the gap between them, it's enough to make his throat tighten. It isn't unusual for Adam to see the signs of attraction from others, even when he's trying his hardest not to notice them. What is unusual is to feel the stirrings of them from himself in return. His fingers grip tighter to the lapels of his coat, still wrapped around Celeste, and he finds himself a little reluctant to let go. There you guys are. Farrah's voice cuts through the heated heaviness that had pressed against them, and Adam holds back a snarl at the interruption. The reaction was not one he intended, and he takes a wide step back from the detective to clear his uncertainty of the moment. 
Adam grits his teeth as Farrah's gaze flickers between the detective, Adam, and the coat still draped over the detective's shoulders. What's going on here, then? A long smile breaks across the young agent's face. You, uh, just peppering the detective with some attention, Adam? The snarl Adam had been holding back almost escapes. Being reminded of the detective's first meeting with them was not appreciated, especially considering it meant he'd had to throw out his best t-shirt. The pungent odor of the pepper spray had refused to quit the garment. Did you come across anyone? Adam asks, trying to distract Farrah's attention. Farrah shakes her head. We thought we might have had someone. She shoots Adam a glance. Obviously, they'd picked up on the other vampire's presence as well. But it turned out to be nothing. I glance between Farrah and Adam, letting out a sigh and running a hand over my hair. Adam's coat weighs against my shoulders, and I realize it has started to feel comfortable. Let's call it a night, I say. We should try to get a few hours of sleep before starting all over again tomorrow. All right, Farrah says though her strange, amused smile remains fixed on Adam. Looking forward to it, detective. Um, here, I say, looking from the coat around my shoulders to Adam. You better have this back. Adam takes it, wrapping it back around himself. He meets my gaze for only a moment, soon withdrawing it to focus on Farah. Well, good night. I turn quickly scanning the street and finding my car glinting dully beneath the street lamp where I had parked. Guess we should get going too, I hear Ferris say. Of course, Adam replies. But when I glance over my shoulder, I find him staring after me for a moment more before disappearing into the night with Farah.